Episode number 20 of the Dig Deep Podcast with the one and only Rachel Joyce. Excited. Excited. Let's do this. All right. Another episode of the Dig Deep Podcast today with Rachel Joyce. Rachel, thank you for being on the show. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm a big fan. I mean, I've been following, I'm a big triathlon fan, so I've been following your career. Um, you know, I love all the things you've done, uh, all these amazing races that you won and and uh, so, yeah, it's a big honor, you know, to have you here. So, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> but okay, so I want to kick off this conversation with probably the most critical question of the of today's uh, interview is: These days, are you going with Joycey or the Joycey-nator? What is uh, your nickname to go? I think Joycey. Joycey. Joycey's <laughs> the one that's here to stay. <laughs> Who gave you that nickname? Uh I've had that through through school. Oh, so really? Yeah. Okay. It's it's been one that stuck for a while. Nice, nice. I like it. I like <laughs> it. Um, uh, of course, we're gonna talk about all things uh, triathlon, uh, which is super exciting. Uh, your career, uh, is amazing. I'm really curious to learn more about um, you know, uh, what you used to do before racing as a pro. Um, but first, I would really love to start talking about this new. I don't know how you call it—a project or a venture that you just started. Uh, is it this year? Called um, the Brave, Bolder, and Stronger, um, which we love to learn more about that. Um, yeah, yeah. Love to learn, love to learn more about like how did it, it all get started? Uh, I know you're working with a partner. How do you guys meet, and what are you guys doing? Oh. Uh, yeah, so I'm. I've been really excited to um, start working with Dana. Uh, Platon this year and we were actually introduced by uh, my agent Franco and he he knows that I've always been an advocate for uh, women in sport mm -hmm. and you know I've had I was involved in the 50 women to Kona campaign right. um, and even way before that uh, you know when I was at school there was no soccer for girls and I was like why <laughs> not and I set up a soccer soccer club for the girls even really though I wasn't That's that awesome. good <laughs> uh you know there was only an 800 on the track for girls and I was like well I can run 1500 so I ran a 1500 solo and so he knew I've, I've come from a history of thinking uh you know women can show their strength uh both in through sport and through what they do uh, outside sport right and with that in mind he introduced me to Dana Platon who is uh she has a long history of uh being in leadership roles uh -huh. um, and she she's a really big thinker you know she these are the kind of vague thoughts I have that I can't quite articulate Dana is someone that can be like well this is what it is and okay. um, she has uh, she did some leadership coaching and other things through her business the WAMI project and uh, the WAMI project uh, that she she gave it its name because she spent a lot of time in Ecuador, yeah, I, um, I saw and she learned a lot from uh, the indigenous women she worked with in the villages. And she came up with um, she she kind of noticed through her work that uh, the strong women and the leader the women she she met who were leaders mm -hmm. shared ten characteristics. And um, you know we talked a lot about. Uh, what she had done and what we were aiming to do and the the first of those 10 characteristics were braver bolder stronger mm -hmm. um dana's also a triathlete she's a mountaineer she's highly accomplished and she we share we had this share passion that's through sport mm -hmm. uh women can you know we can come together we can share experiences and we can take lessons that we can then uh, use in other areas of our yeah. life, whether that be in family life, in business, right. in the business world, and you know, building our careers. So we came up with this kind of syllabus just this year, and we, you know, you can talk about things for ages and ages, and we're like, let's just do this, and mm -hmm. we set up these three right. workshops in, Bol in Boulder. The first of which was uh, swim braver, uh, bike Boulder, 
and run stronger. Uh-huh. So uh, we had those over the summer and we had a really uh, cool collection of women who came to their, to those workshops. And what, what those workshops were was we would do a very skills orientated session in the morning, um, whether it was in the pool or out mm-hmm. on the bike or on the track. And then we'd break for lunch and then uh, Dana would lead a conversation and workshop session on teaching us mental skills and there was a lot of discussion uh, and it was a really powerful both I mean we were we were leading the workshops but it was powerful for us to see mm. um, how much uh, we learned from the women that were there as well as they learned from us in sharing their experiences and you know how how can we become braver bolder stronger in life yeah, and right. sports the perfect conduit to to learning those lessons so yeah. that was the beginning but it's really just the very beginning and we have some really exciting projects coming up and uh we'll be launching something later later in the fall awesome. which will give a kind of a wider vision our vision uh yeah a wider look at what our vision is going forward that's awesome um i, I and I, I was saying this before we started this conversation. I love that idea because it's not just um, a, a just a just triathlon focus camp. Uh, it's more like okay, using you know um, the skills and experience that you've learned in your career, that they have learned in your career, and using those skills into all things leadership and, and empowering women, and, and mm-hmm. I'm sure inspiring. And that's something that I I found pretty. I mean, it's great. I I you know i'm always on social media and following um people on social media or i guess following trends and um that's something that i've noticed happening more and more of course uh, you know the last years but when i think of, of what you're saying i think about a brand for instance like wasel you know mm-hmm. um like yeah. uh strong brand for women uh by women for women empowering women or um there's several people on social media that uh i think uh, are trying to uh to lead that kind of, uh, um, I don't know, like initiative and, and yeah. you know, uh, uh, yeah, I think. I, that I think one of the things we, uh, we like to think that we're like a kind of one of our foundational principles is that, you know, sometimes women need empowering, sometimes men need empowering, but what we really think is women can do it themselves. And that's the, the basis that we're working on, you know, it, sometimes you need to strengthen certain skills you have. Sometimes you need to collaborate with others to find those skills. But uh, women can do it themselves. They, mm. they don't need someone else necessarily yeah, exactly. to, to help them do it all the time. And it seemed from what I was reading on um, on your website, um, I think there's a part where it says that the fact that when when you have these retreats or these meetings, it's just like there's some kind of like, w- you know, when there's this group meetings, there's a transformational kind of factor. Like, I guess the fact that people uh, share their own experiences and learn things as a group, I think that that that, um, that experience really helped them to really, you know, transform themselves mm-hmm. and change and grow. And so it, it seems like this idea of getting people together um, and work together and learn together is a pretty pretty powerful. Yeah, right? yeah. absolutely. Cool. We we definitely found that, and it's uh, maybe what I mean. I think there's uh, it's kind of uh, a formula that lots of things go into that, but it's uh, one one factor is it's carving out a time. You know, life is busy for all of us, mm. and sometimes you just don't have that hour to kind of put down on paper or say out loud to someone what are your goals, how are you going to get there, and uh, one of the things I, I didn't necessarily know going into creating the workshops with Dana was that the workshops created that space where you could really, I- in a very supportive atmosphere uh, and with with guidance and mm. nudging, you can say it out loud and mm. write it down. And just that in itself means you kind of leave with more of a plan and a plan means okay. you're more likely to execute the plan. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was... Uh, nice cool to see that and just seeing people uh you know we've we've a lot of us have stayed connected and you know i know what events people are doing and you can see things being put into action those goals that goal setting i'm kind of pushing outside their comfort zones nice 
another and me myself too like i definitely it got me working more on that kind of thing yeah it's funny i when you say that i i think about uh maybe it's not the same but i think about every time i get um i interview people in this podcast and this is like the 20th edition so it's very new but i um i get i feel that i get to learn something new you know Mm -hmm. from people and uh uh that's one of my favorite things about doing this i was also thinking about this other group um have you heard of trail sisters uh, or do you know who they are? It's yes, I have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I think of, of, of I don't know, the c- kind of the same initiative that you guys are working on, um, I'm a big fan of them because um, I think their goal or the mission is to basically find ways to, to um, for women to have a stronger presence on trail running. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, you know, empower them and inspire them. So um, it's a group that was started by an ultra runner. Gina Cressy and um, it's so cool to see how this community I think they call this sisterhood you know is mm-hmm. growing and uh, yeah it's it's pretty cool so uh, it's awesome it's awesome mm-hmm. um, okay so you did a workshop and you say there's a lot of exciting things happening in the, in the future that's great I, I read that there's a, a a retreat in 2019. Yes, nice, yeah. Nice. Hope, hopefully two retreats. Oh, um, cool. We've uh, had this uh, fantastic opportunity to work with the Live Well Center in Park City mm-hmm. in Utah. And I, I flew out there with uh, Craig Alexander Crowey um, back in June. Mm-hmm. And we got to have a look at the facility. We met with Max Tester, who is a doctor who yeah. has a wealth mm-hmm. of experience of and knowledge. and. <laughs> We looked, you know, he, he did, uh, Craig got a bike fit. I, he kind of gave me a, uh, an assessment of any imbalances and he just picked up on real nuances, which yeah. I was like, yes, that's exactly right. That's where, that's awesome. if I have a niggle. Uh, and we also got to ride and run around there and it was just, it was simply stunning. Yeah. And we went in June and the plan is that we have our retreat in Park City in June. Um, so I'm so excited. That's going to be four days. We're going to be, announcing the exact dates in mm-hmm. the next 10 days so uh we're nice. we're super excited to uh get the word out on that and i think we'll probably be flying out to park city um just to uh reconnect with the hospital there right, and right. um do a bit more exploring ahead of the the following year i assume that you're doing these retreats you guys are doing that because you, you probably saw a very strong response from these workshops right like yeah. it gave you an, an indication of okay this and and a follow-up question would be is this something that you kind of env- envision doing after you're done with your pro career yeah absolutely um i, I mean i won't lie 2018 this has been a, a fantastic project to, to get my teeth into in in some ways 2018 hasn't panned out exactly as I had hoped Uh, but sometimes when that happens other opportunities come up so it's been good to get my teeth stuck into this I I think I will uh, you know 2018 I haven't raced I will be racing again Um, but it's so easy just to race 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 and then you stop and you're like what next right I feel fortunate that I've been able to of marry two passions of mine uh sport and triathlon with um kind of the the power of the women's community yeah. and leadership and you know ultimately w- we're working with adults at the moment but i see a real scope of op- you know i'd love to start this much earlier with uh girls in school because i think uh you can form habits and start learning skills the sooner you learn them, the better. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I and agree. And I think sport's a great yeah. way to start bringing those leadership skills out in girls. But that's, you know, you've got to have a five-year plan. <laughs> Currently, we're, we're starting with adults, but yep. that's kind of one of the ways I see it going in the future. I think it's such a great idea to, to think about um, teaching, you know, kids when they're, when they're in school, all things leadership skills. I, I think about my days in school, you probably too, or even in college, that sometimes you learn things that are, uh, that are all hard skills or, or courses that you don't necessarily are going to use. I remember when I was in college, I, I learned, uh, I don't know, um, oh, oh, like universal history, which is super important, but I don't know. I, sometimes you feel that you could have learned something else that would be more useful these days. But uh, uh, yeah, that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, 
So why don't we talk about growing up in London? You're from England? I'm from England. Okay. I didn't grow up in London, though. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I was actually born in Mexico and lived there oh. for four years. Oh, awesome. And then uh, as a family, we moved back to England and mm -hmm. we, we moved around quite a lot. So I spent... Um, early part of my childhood mostly in Derbyshire and then okay. in Suffolk which is kind of east of London so so when do you move from Mexico to England uh, I or think I was about four so you, you learn to speak Spanish at, at the time <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> I think I have uh, I've tried to relearn it several times and I'm getting I'm kind of a language skill is something I would love to have so I'm yep. kind of on Duolingo and I'm do you try and oh, speak it oh do you it, like so it I do well it's it's not the perfect way to learn a language, but at least it's reminding yeah. me. And I am getting better. Yeah. I just need to speak it a bit more. I'll tell, I'm from Peru, so I speak Spanish. Okay. Mexican accent is one of my favorite accents ever. Uh, I think along with um, the Argentine accent, it's so like passionate and uh, so much energy. Mm -hmm. I love, yeah, I love that. Um, so growing up in England, um, you had a, a, a swimming background, is that right? Yes, okay. yeah. I Did you start swimming when you were in school? like school or college or um yeah i started learning you know my parents put me into swimming <laughs> lessons so that i could swim and it was something i really enjoyed so okay. i was pretty much swimming from the age of probably six upwards um and i swam through high school i actually uh, you know and i swam I did a lot of competitions mm -hmm. i swam to a national standard and then about 18 i kind of W stepped away for a year I took a year traveling and then when I went to university I joined the swim team again and it was we didn't we trained hard we played hard I think <laughs> would be the best way to describe it yeah. uh, and I'd say probably some of the best swimming I had was actually when I started working in London um, as a master's swimmer and okay. um, that yeah and um how do you transition to triathlon? But before talking about that, okay, I want to ask you a couple of things because this is so cool. Like, um, you're swimming adventures. Like, I have here that um, you once run in, in three degrees Celsius water, uh, in three degrees Celsius waters in the European Cold Water Swimming Championships. Yes. Can yeah. you talk more? So, three degrees Celsius waters is 37 Fahrenheit degrees. So. It's very, it was very, very cold. So, we have, um, there's a very, big outdoor pool in southeast london oh, and okay. it's a lido and so in january they had the european swimming championship <laughs> cold water swimming championships and i can tell you like we, it was 25 meters and it is incredibly incredibly cold but you have to jump <laughs> into the water you don't dive in because obviously then there's the chance that you're gonna have a heart attack <laughs> of the shock so yeah. you have to get in and you have to put your shoulders down under the water before you start so oh you're my really oh really gosh. cold before you okay. even get started swimming but it was really fun i did that with um the otter swimming club who i i'm still a member of and uh -huh. um we we were out there in force it was good fun you just remind me of the polar plunge and yeah boulder. it's a little bit like that <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, this thing that happens every year here in boulder so it's not like swimming at, at rallies here that uh, outdoors that it can be cold in the winter but uh the, the, the water is really nice no 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 <laughs> it's not like that and how about if you also talk about this time that you swam with a friend a part of the english channel um so you you swam in 16 degree uh, waters which is 60 Fahrenheit degree and you were not wearing a wetsuit now oh my god I, I think about the times when I've swam in really cold water and it's nothing compared to what you did so I think well it's nothing compared to what my friend did my friend Catherine Meerman was swimming the channel mm. that year and uh, the, the way it works is um, the rules of the channel swimming association is you have to swim the first six hours solo but then you, you're allowed a buddy swimmer. And okay. a, your buddy swimmer can swim next to you, not in front of you or behind it's you. It's like a pacer in ultras. Uh, well, you, you could have more just... So I think the person has something to look at other than yeah. an endless sea. Yeah. Um, so I would get in for an hour and swim with her and then get out. And then after another hour, I'd be allowed to get back in. And um, I tell you, Ironman is hard, but swimming the channel is one of the mo the hardest. Yeah feats i've seen someone do because do you know you know if you swim you don't get to speak to anyone you're very much it's just you you're not there's no distractions yeah. you know if you're on your bike you're seeing the scenery but if you're swimming the channel you're just like looking into the abyss and yeah. 
you know, uh, oh, it's hard. And we're not, you know, we're land-born animals. So exactly. To be That's what I was exactly <laughs> thinking. Like, oh, the breeding thing, you know, yeah. it's not easy. Um, yeah. So how long is the channel? Uh, or like how many hours would it, it take? It tw- 12 hours to swim the channel. Oh, so sounds brutal. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. It's funny because I was just thinking about these races like the Norsemen or their, like the non-Ironman races that, um, that take place in, in really cold temperatures like the Kelman or Swissman. Uh, yes, yeah. Like, have you done any of those races? No, or no, you? Norsemen sounds fu- like <laughs> right? you know, fun in that hard way and yeah. kind of really getting back to the basics of yeah. the sport. So. I was thinking about um, any bucket lists that uh, you'd love to do. Uh, yeah, I definitely have bucket. Norseman would probably be one of those bucket list races. Um, Wisconsin this past weekend, mm. I kind of really uh, appeal. It's, just, it's one of those races. It's been there for 16 years, I think. Mm. Or, yeah, 16 years. And I love that the community really gets behind it. Mm-hmm. So that would be one. Um, I think that one or Placid. I probably couldn't do both of them as bucket list. But, uh, oh, because they're kind of really close from each other. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, I think I would allow one North American race to be on my bucket list. So one of those two I love the sound of and the look of um i read wildflower i read yes um, yeah escape from alcatraz would be another (laughs) one it's so so cold but then you're you're used to that so you're swimming i think i I think i would need to get used to it again it's been a while uh yeah i bet that sounds pretty crazy um so how do you start doing triathlons how do you transition from from swimming to tries it was a it was a bit of a gradual um transition mm. like i did a few triathlons um and then got s- and then when i started working i didn't you know i was working pretty long hours mm. um in a law office and so swimming made sense because i could i could do one sport it was difficult to fit i felt uh. like it would be difficult to fit more than one sport um but i had done the london marathon and um i loved the endurance aspect of mm. that race that when you get to 20 miles you know your legs are screaming for you to shut up yeah (laughs) uh, to stop but you just have to keep going it's a real mental game so that really appeals so that kind of uh piqued my interest in endurance sports and as i was swimming i still felt i had having done a you know couple of triathlons i felt like i had unfinished it, it was one of those things i thought i could be good at this and so i felt i had unfinished business and when i was swimming mm. in london at otters uh people were encouraging a few guys that i was swimming with encouraged me to get a bike and then i went <laughs> on a bike training camp and then was doing half iron mans and but the full Iron Man was always there, you know, something I knew I would want to do. And um, but so you always knew. Uh, having started triathlon, I knew that I wanted to do an Iron Man. It's like yeah. me. <laughs> I remember when I first I used to run. I I would do marathons, and of course you start thinking about what's next and triathlon. You know, I started getting curious about them. And for some reason, when I started training for for triathlons, I always knew that I wanted to do. Uh, an Ironman just because of the endurance yeah. uh, factor like I, I'm i not a fast uh, athlete but uh, I'm what my uh, Tony Tony the Boom used to coach me he would call me an, uh, an engine okay. a diesel, diesel machine because I would just I can go lo- long but uh, not necessarily fast but I enjoy all things long distance so uh, yeah nice um, so okay you started doing that and do you remember, like, your your first tries, were they, like, uh, uh, sprints, Olympic, or did you just jump into halves right away? Um, when, I s- when I kind of went back to triathlon, I, I jumped into a half Ironman to begin with and um, had one of those days, I think, beginner's luck, and it felt really easy, and <laughs> I ended up... It didn't feel easy, but it felt... Uh, there was flow, if you get what I mean. And it was I, not the I, world championships, right? In no, 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 no. <laughs> that you won. <laughs> no. But then the one after that, then then I realized there was this opportunity to try and qualify for the 70.3 world championships okay. as an age grouper. 
And so I, I had memories of this first one that I'd done and I was like, okay, I've got this. Um, but the second half Ironman really bit me in the butt and oh, yeah. you know, I was, it was <laughs> a much harder, co- a much hillier course. Okay. It was cold. I got cold on the bike and I was very close to bonking and very close mm-hmm. to thinking oh, I should just stop. Mm. But I had a couple of friends who'd come down for the weekend to watch me and I was, I was like, oh, you can't just pull out now. You have to <laughs> keep going. And yeah. uh, it was a good job I did because I kind of plugged away on the run and then just I, I won my age group and got my slot. Nice. Uh, and I had a whole year then to train for the 70.3 World Championships. And that's when I got a coach and started being a bit more methodical with my training. That's what I was going to ask you. Did you train by yourself uh, until then? Like for, for Yeah, I would kind of just do what I wanted. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so when was that Clearwater? That world champ. That was 06? in 2006. Yeah. And so that was the initial, like Ironman branded, um, 70.3 yeah, 70.3 world, world, world champ- championships. Yeah. That's when uh, Crowe won, right? Yeah, I think or it no? was. Maybe can't remember. I know Sam McGlo- McGlone won. Okay. Okay. So. Cool. Uh, half Ironmans. I remember my first one. It was. Um, I used to live in in St. Louis in Missouri, so I did one there. And it was so hard. I remember the feeling of finishing the f- my first half Ironman. It was very similar of the f- uh, of the feeling uh, of finishing my first fall. It's <laughs> like I don't know. It's uh, even though the distance was twice as long yes, as the yeah. half. It's always really hard, especially your first one. Uh, yeah, that was mm-hmm. that was not fun. So okay, you started um, doing all these races and getting more comfortable in the seventy point three distance, I guess. Um, talk more about, was that the time when you decided to, uh, stop, you know, working as a lawyer and then focus on as a professional, like, I'm curious to, to learn more about, um, the period of, of your life or like, you know, I'm, 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 th- I'm thinking you're thinking all these things like, what should I do? Should I go for it? It's definitely a risk that you're taking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How was yeah. that? Uh, it was definitely, uh, I was pulled in two directions at that time. Mm. And um, I, I think I knew it was time to, do, you know, and I went back and forth for quite a long time. And I think I knew it was time to do something was when I was really, because I felt like I should be, I wanted to be doing triathlon more than work. So then I was stopped enjoying work so mm-hmm. much. And But again, it wasn't, uh, I was lucky. I went in to my boss and said, I'm going to retar- resign. I want to become a professional triathlete. And he actually kind of pulled me back a bit and was like, well, how about you work three days a week and that gives you two extra days to train. So I had this opportunity to kind of make the transition uh-huh. gradually and still be making some money yeah. because uh, even when you're pretty successful, there's not that much money in triathlon. Of but course. when you're <laughs> going from being an age grouper to a pro and you have no sponsors and it's going to take you a little while to get any results, uh, Unless, unless you've got like a secret stash of money, which <laughs> I didn't, uh, you know, it's pretty good for me to have an income coming yeah. in. Yeah. It's just amazing that uh, pros don't make uh, that much in this sport, considering how hard it is and all, you know, the hours that you have to put in. And so it's crazy. And so when, once you made that decision, um, did you keep, uh, were you still doing 70.3? So did you start focusing on 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 full ironmans um initially i carried on racing half ironmans and i wasn't terribly successful in fact i was pretty bad at being a professional um i would i just was so enthusiastic that i would train too much and I, there was a big cycle you know two years probably of where i was in a cycle of getting either injured or ill and mm. there was a lack of consistency in yeah. my training um, and I would race and not do very well. And then my self-belief would go down. Mm. And I was very close to thinking, okay, now it's time to just go back to my day job. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's always... And, and since then, it was very difficult to see at the time. But since then, you know, I've, I've listened to entrepreneurs talk and other athletes talk. And I feel like you have to... So often you you so close to giving up on something, but there's something... You know, my self-belief was down, but there was still a part of me thought that, you know, I, oh. I can succeed at this. So in the end, I actually 
resigned from my job completely and 100% dedicated myself to doing my first Ironman, which was Ironman Florida in 2008. And um, I kind of, it wasn't like I was an, I'd given myself the ultimatum, but I kind of said to myself, okay, this is an opportunity to really enjoy the process of getting ready for Ironman Florida. Um, whatever happens, you've always wanted to do an Ironman, even if you have to go back to your job, mm -hmm. that's okay because you've, you know, ticked off a bucket list thing. So I kind of tried to remove a little bit of the pressure that I had been putting on myself. And um, I managed to remain injury free. I was healthy. And I went into Ironman Florida and I came fifth. And uh, I had actually lined up two months of work back at uh, Taylor Westing, my law firm. Mm. So, but coming fifth gave me enough belief that I was on the right track. And so I really went, I went home from that and I worked really hard for two months and saved every penny I could <laughs> right. so that in 2009 I could really right. go for it. And I had my dream then, you know, my goal for 2009 was to get to Kona. And so I was pretty much on a mission to do that. Yeah. It's interesting what you said about um, when you were kind of struggling to believe in yourself when you were training for these half Ironmans, but you still... Uh, you you didn't, didn't necessarily see the result, but you still believe in yourself. It reminds me a little bit of kind of my journey as an entrepreneur with my business is you work hard and you don't necessarily see the results right away. But then there's always this little voice <laughs> inside of you who tells you, you know, you're going to do it. You just need to keep working. You know? yes, and it, yeah. not every day is going to be perfect. There's going to be a lot of days where there's so much self-doubt. Um, but for some reason, it's like this stubborn little voice that tells you, you know, do it because it's what you're really passionate about. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I used to work in corporate, so, and, you know, all kinds of great opportunities, but I always had this, I don't know, like curiosity to start my own thing and build something, and, and yeah, it's not easy. Talk about quitting your job and, yes, <laughs> and yeah. you know, all kinds of, you know, things like that. But, um, so, okay, so that was 2008 that you um you did Ironman Florida and then what was next D were you like still um uh coaching by your, uh, yourself or um no that uh, I had a coach that I'd had since um I started in 2006 his name was Richard Jones and then I, I'd say it was more of a collaboration by then you know I was kind of taking what he was giving me and then um probably doing too much half the time but <laughs> I then I went on the mission and in April that year I raced Ironman South Africa mm. um, which probably wasn't a smart move there was only one Kona slot there so I was kind of really yeah. gunning for the win and I came third but again it was another step up in performance mm -hmm. and I learned a lot from that um, and then I uh, still had the bit between my teeth for Kona, so six weeks later I towed the line at Ironman Lanzarote, mm -hmm. and that's where I came second, and that's where I got my Kona slot. So That's yeah. a really, I mean, every Ironman race is hard, but Ironman Lanzarote is one of the hardest. Uh, w w how was your experience there? I've heard it's one of the m most difficult ones in, in the circuit. Uh, I mean, it is a t it's a really tough course. It's, it's pretty hilly, and oh, okay. it's, it's more the wind that is um, that's kind of makes it su more hard like if you, there are sections of the course where you're going uphill which would be <laughs> nothing if there wasn't also a big headwind yeah so um, but i love that course i've trained a lot in lanzarote and um i i would say actually i love living in boulder colorado but i really miss my training camps in lanzarote yeah. um so it is a hard it is a hard course but it is one of my favorites because you you cycle around the entire island mm -hmm. um, and the run is just really fun because it's in this holiday destination town. So you people who have no idea what an Ironman are, but mm -hmm. they see this going <laughs> on and they really are rooting for you as you, oh, cool. as you run up and down. And I imagine the conditions are, I would say, pretty similar to Kona. What would you say? You talk about yeah, with the wind. Yeah, it can be. And, yeah. Um, Maybe not quite as humid, mm -hmm. but um, it is definitely can be hot and windy. Okay. And it's a volcanic island, so there are definitely <laughs> parallels to be drawn. I'm already picturing people cheering on you. Like, yeah, go, Rachel. <laughs> they do it in Spanish. Uh, yes, yeah, Rachel. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then I'm, I'm looking here. Um, 
So in 2009, is that when you did your first uh, Kona? Iron yes. Man? Okay. Yeah. So so that was after, of course, like you, you were saying, you qualify on Lanzarote. How was that? Uh, that first Kona experience? Uh, <laughs> it was probably one of my... Uh, it, it's like so many things it's hard to replicate the first one you know this was a place that, first of all it would be my goal for the year to get there yeah. and uh then i read i you know read so much about it in the years before and of course. uh it was kind of close to being overwhelming the pre-race week because these were all these places and all these people that i'd been mm. reading about and whilst i was racing as a professional i really didn't feel you know, I still felt very new to the game. I was new to the game less right. than a year before. I'd still been working in a law firm. And so I could feel myself in race week being kind of beating myself before I even got an opportunity to mm. to race. And I kind of took a step back and I was like, all, all this is is another race. You just right. have to go as fast as you can. And that's what I enjoy doing. So um, and then the race day was kind of this surreal experience. Now I, I was coming out of the wood around these people who i had read so much <laughs> about and i was like That's whoa awesome. <laughs> and then on the bike I'd, I'd actually changed my coaching up over the summer and i was working with a cycling coach because i felt like that was my best bet to make an improvement both on my bike and my run and the mm -hmm. run was really my weakness and i was just very i just got a power meter i was looking at my power and i was kind of astonished when um on the second half of the bike, I started overtaking people and I came in T2 in fourth place and I was kind of almost like, what? And, you know, <laughs> I was like, this can't be happening. I'm in fourth place in the right. Ironman World Championships and I hadn't even done an Ironman one year before. Um, and then, you know, I did go back on that run, but I finished sixth and uh, I still get goosebumps when I remember how I felt when I was running down uh, the finishing shoot because I was... I, of course, I had that goal, but I hadn't been brave enough to say it out loud to anyone else, yeah. but it was to come top 10, and there I was, sixth in the world, and it took a long time for that to um, sink in, and I, I know other people have come, and they've had more dramatic debuts, but mm. with the odd exception, man, many of those have had like a, a longer history oh in yeah sport, i can agree so. yeah that's an amazing debut is that so that was six your first uh kona as a pro yes yeah okay wow well my first kona full stop oh yeah you're right how many times have you done kona uh eight times eight times so 2013 was second place and then when you play second again in right? 2015 2015 yeah okay so that was before you took a break uh uh, because you became a mom. Yes. Uh, yeah. How old is Archie? Uh, he just turned two. Two. I've yeah. seen. I've seen your post on Instagram. He's pretty yes. cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. And oh my god, I was just thinking about. I was watching this. No, I was reading something on your website. I think, um, 2017. There was this crazy year where okay, you decide to do Ironman Boulder. And you end up doing like four races in a period of what three months? Or it was four months. Or but four months yeah. still. Um, and something that I thought was so cool is like, okay, you decided to do Boulder, not necessarily because you thought that you were gonna qualify for Kona, but I guess it was a way for you to kind of get back into the routine of, of racing. I imagine. Yes. Yeah. I'd done a couple of races before that, and I'd gone into 2017 uh, thinking I would focus on. 70.3 distance just okay. because it's uh you know less training and easier to fit around being a mom and that was always my priority you know brett has a very demanding job he's um out of the house most days at 4 30 wow. a.m and uh it was important for us to be as involved in you know we wanted him to be with us most mm -hmm. of the time in that first year and so I thought doing a 70.3 would allow, would fit into our family life the best. Mm -hmm. um, but when Ironman Boulder had um, the, the the pro field again, there was just a part <laughs> of me was like, oh, you know, I loved racing the 70.3s, yeah. but I really felt like Ironman is my thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, w it the the focus at that point or the goal was at that point wasn't to qualify for Kona. It just was, uh, okay, it's a hometown race. Let's just see yeah. what I can do. And um, I was 
you know, sometimes you race beneath your fit, and, you know, you're fitter than your race shows. But I think Boulder was one of those races where I raced above my fitness level and yeah. um, was, you know, I had done one, I think maybe one run over two hours or one run of two hours. I hadn't done a lot of volume and but somehow remained strong at the back end of that marathon and and won and that was when i was like oh yeah. you know you have to i really feel like with sport you have to follow what is motivates you and yeah. you have to know what your why is otherwise it's very difficult to motivate yourself to do the training and it was at that point i was like i do i want to get back to kona i want to go, go there with yeah. archie and so then that's when i started this rather ridiculous run of <laughs> Um, training uh, and racing and in re in retrospect I I can you know it's very easy to to have the benefit of hindsight I knew it took me a long time to recover from Boulder because I think I had raced above what my training had allowed and so I went into Ironman Canada with a bit of a niggle and just not I hadn't allowed myself to recover from Boulder yeah and it, it's difficult to recover when you're breastfeeding yeah and of you're burning the candle yeah. at both ends and um, so I had to come third or better in Ironman Canada. I came fourth. So there I was faced with this dilemma. Maybe I would make the cut, but it wasn't a cert thing. So <laughs> three weeks later, I was on the start line for Ironman Mont Tremblant, Blanc, yeah. which actually then I had the fitness and I felt better than I had at any point of the year going into Ironman Mont Tremblant. It was that because you, um, uh, like, rec like, did you st kind of stop training between Ironman? What do you do between Ironman Can and the Mont Blanc? I guess to help you get not better? too much. Yeah, right. You just recover, <laughs> and uh, you know, I did a few key sessions, but it was mostly listening to how I felt yeah. and um, absorbing the fitness from the previous mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, right couple of months. Yeah, there was two of my Ironmans in there, but it, it, I did feel fresher, and some of that's just luck of the draw. You know, Archie wasn't teething then; I was getting more sleep yeah. and. Things just clicked better for yeah. uh, Ironman Mont Tremblant. And then when was that? Mont that Tremblant? was the very end of August. I think okay. around th actually around the 23rd of August. So then I had, I think, six or seven weeks in Tacona. Yeah. Wow. How was um, how was uh, Kona 2017? Uh, I'll be honest, it was disappointing. Yeah. And uh, at the time, I beat myself up a lot about it. Uh, and it's only kind of with a bit more like 360 overview of that, I can understand uh, why I didn't perform. And I really think physically I was in pretty good shape, but uh, I had the toll of three Ironmans under my <laughs> belt. And then I just had a few things came up in my preparation. I think four weeks out, I was on a training run and I tripped on my shoelace and uh, mm. hit the ground with my chin. and. It oh. sounds really amusing, uh, but it was actually incredibly painful because yeah. I had like whiplash. Oh so no. I had, I was dealing, I had that for the start. And then five days later, I was back in urgent ER, you know, in urgent care with Archie who'd been sick. And, mm. you know, I've kind of been thinking a lot about resilience just for some of the projects we have coming up. And I was kind of, I think what I was beating myself up was why couldn't I bounce back from that? But we're all human. And, mm. you know, then uh, Tim Don was in that horrendous yeah. uh, car accident. And you you can ask, so often we ask ourselves to be superhuman, but we are all human. And yeah. uh, sometimes it just, you can't bounce back each time. It just, t you need to collect yourself. And I think had maybe I had two more weeks, I could have been I a bit you. more ready. Yeah. Um, but it, I think I found it hard because... It was the first time in a race where I felt like it was uh, my mental game that let me down and not my physical game. So. Got it. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, and so uh, are you are you planning to go back next year uh, to uh, pursue? It's definitely, an, uh, I like the way the new qualifying system is. Um, I'm someone that really likes to peak for one race and the point system has gone. So yeah, that, it would that need, was ridiculous. I would Sorry. need to... <laughs> perform in one race and so we'll see i'm not ruling it out for yeah. sure nice and uh now you are training with julie dibbins is that right yes how yeah. long have you been training um, with her this year I've, I've kind of been more on the periphery but i've been coached by her since 2015 yeah. and um i've have to say i've loved all the coaches that i've had um and 
so sometimes when you see so, someone who's had you know I've had three I'd say three coaches during my professional career and um I've learned so much from all of them and Julie really was perfect we'd, we'd train together and I was at a point in my career I was I'd been really disappointed with my third place in 2014 mm -hmm. and I'd put too much pressure and I kind of needed a different approach to my training and Julie was like the breath of, breath of fresh air yeah. and she's created this awesome um, kind of squad in Boulder. Yeah, I follow it on Instagram, it's fun. I, yeah. um, I'd always been a bit of a lone ranger oh, but okay. um, <laughs> I was at a point in my career where it was just uh, great to have a people to train with. We had a really good atmosphere going and yeah. that was, we. The, the group was fairly small there. It's, it's grown a lot but um like I love the atmosphere, the su the support and that she's kind of created with the yeah. people she has in the nice in the group. Yeah, nice. Wow. And she's yeah. a woman coach. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's amazing. Who's yeah, like so she coaches uh, Tim, right? And Tim and, Don. And, and she's got uh, Tim O'Donnell. Tim O'Donnell now. Matt uh -huh. Hansen, Lauren Brandon, Dee Dee Griesbauer. Oh, Lauren too. Yeah. Matt Hansen. Huh. Wow. And I'm probably missing some people. Yeah. But um some great age groupers so it's a super atmosphere and you also coach too right yes i do okay. yeah i have an instagram friend uh brianna oh yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 she's great i coach <laughs> brianna yeah, she's course. great yeah. i've been coaching her since 2016 and she's so, so talented yeah, but no. um and she's so nice and sweet and i, I love she, to see she her has cats <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> the yeah. videos of her cats what were you gonna say I, she's uh, but she has that competitive instinct and you can see that through both her training and uh yeah and when she races but yeah she's <laughs> um i have i really love the people i coach it's i i don't coach that many people individually because i really want to be inv as involved as possible in what they're doing and yeah. i feel like that's if i have a small that's good group then i can do that nice how do you meet uh Franco Batter, uh, your business, your manager. I'm just curious. Uh, well, the triathlon world's fairly small, mm. and um, I uh, had I'd heard of him, and um, before I kind of asked to meet up with him, I think in 2014, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we started working together then. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I like him. He's funny. Mm -hmm. So I have a random question. You write Cervelo, right? I, I did. Oh, you did. Okay. Can can we share what new brand you're writing or? Uh, I'm brandless at the moment, so oh. uh, yeah. I was I was I wanted to ask you, um, and just because I'm curious, between the P five X and the P five, did you like one better than the other? Because I, I I think I saw you riding both bikes. Yes, it's not that you yeah. just transitioned to just one and. Uh, you know, I'll be honest. I think um, the P five is my absolute favorite. Mm. Uh, time trial bike uh, it's not to say i didn't like the p5x but for me and how i ride my bike um my forever tt bike would i would uh towards the p5 than the p5x yeah. nice yeah the p5x looks i don't know maybe just there's yeah i don't know i, I like the p5 better i i ride trek so okay I mean, but uh, <laughs> it looks better the p5 looks better but um so what a wow do you want all these like amazing races challenge roth how was that 2012 oh, definitely a <laughs> highlight that's an amazing race yeah. yeah yeah um any any particular moment that you can think of uh, uh let me ask you this uh, do, do you remember having a very low moment like a, a true digging deep moment i mean of course you know ironman races are all about digging deep but is there a particular moment that you can think of during you know, during the race that where you in were, yeah, you were struggling um, and, you know, how do you overcome that? I, n not particular, no more than any other Ironman. I had had a bit of a, uh, an imbalance like hip, mm. like ITB issue. So I definitely remember on the run that was like something I was aware of, but uh, not to the extent. Well, it's your memory forgets the things <laughs> where you really had to dig deep. So I didn't really... I just have fond memories of the, how awesome the crowds were on that race. And the course is beautiful, too. I know. So you recommend doing that race? Yeah, I think that yeah. has to be on everyone's bucket list. How about I'm in Texas? That was um, 2013. Yeah, I I tell people I think that's one of my best performances ever. Um, just it was... A s s I, everyone says it, it was the hottest race I've ever done. Yeah. It was super hot. And just one of those days where it came easy and 
Uh, I felt good on the bike and good on the run and in control. And I think I was seventh in the entire field, which wow. you know, <laughs> only 25 minutes off the male pro mm. winner. And uh, I've that was it was just a good day. And it was also confirmation. To, you know, I changed coaches to Dave Scott that year, and it was a lot of uh, a lot of hard work came through in that race. Mm. Okay. Did you also train with Mark Allen? No. Okay. So it was Dave. Okay. Um, and then ITU or long course championships. Where was that in 2011? The ITU? Uh, Vegas. Vegas. Oh. Yeah. Is it, was it hot and humid? Uh, no, or? actually it snowed the night before and they canceled the swim. What? So. <laughs> yeah. Vegas is always uh, crazy. Curious. What other uh, pro women athletes, uh, I don't know, do you admire? Oh, so many. You know, I've been doing a little bit of commentating recently for Iron Man, and yeah. uh, it's been fun because then I kind of really can be a. F obviously, I'm ca commentating, but um, <laughs> I'm a fan of the sport, and I love seeing and celebrating what the the pros are doing. So, oh, I, it's, this list is too long. Yeah, I so think, that, and that's one of the things I love about the sport: the friendships and yeah. the comp. How we're friends off the course mostly, and just but when we're on the course it's just straight competition yeah. and i respect my competition yeah. I, i you know m i like how they race and you know there i always have my favorites who i you know you look and you're like <laughs> i know we're gonna have a fair race today yeah you, you know you always have a soft spot for the people who race like you and i like to race yeah you know I, i'm kind of someone who just likes to to go for it there's a kind of if, if we're all divided on the bike all the better you know yeah. it's each each woman for themselves i've seen um i think i saw a photo of you on instagram where you are with michael lobato uh you yes, guys are coming yeah. he's such a great commentator i'm a big fan of hi uh, him and uh uh, uh mad Lieto, maybe yes yeah they're yeah. so good uh, every time in october they i like how you know they they do their thing it's always mm -hmm. it's always fun um I'm just curious, any 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 mentors that you remember having, I don't know, during your career, not only as a triathlete, you know, uh, when, when you were um, as a, working as a lawyer as well, somebody that you can think of? Um, I think, I mean, I've or always, admi models, I've always you know. admired the people that I'm racing for, but really the people who I look to for advice are kind of my inner circle, my, you know, my very close friends yep. and Brett, my partner and family so uh, yeah i there are so many sports women or people that i admire yeah um but i think it's sometimes they can seem a bit far off you know like whereas i i'm lucky i've been surrounded by strong role models around me yeah. and um so that's kind of where i draw um has um, archie showed any indication of uh swim bike run interest uh, <laughs> he definitely loves his bike <laughs> yeah. so uh we'll see yeah is brett also uh he does also triathlons or runs yes. or yeah nice. we met through triathlon he, oh, okay. he does less of them now he's more into biking at the moment but yeah. um we met in hawaii so. oh cool are you uh do you have any interest in other sports besides triathlon like i don't know trail running ultra um, running we talked about bucket lists a bit earlier and mm -hmm. i would love to do the leadville 100 one day is kind of a bucket list for me so. run or bike run yeah because julie she's one. Oh yeah and yeah. she came second this oh, year yeah 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 she's amazing I'm yeah. incredibly strong uh cyclist thank you very much rachel for being the show it's been a pleasure yeah thanks for having me <laughs> so for people who would like to um learn more about what you're doing with brave bolder stronger uh, or if people want to get in touch with you online where can they find you uh if you go to www.racheljoyce.org forward slash braver bolder stronger awesome. uh, there's lots of information there or just drop me a line you can usually get in touch with me via <laughs> Instagram or Twitter or something. Awesome. So. Looking forward to next year's retreat. Um, and thanks again for being on the show. Yeah, Appreciate thanks it. for having me. <laughs> thanks, Rachel. Thanks. Bye.